My name is Luisa. Uh, I'm a project manager in Latin Startups. I'm from Brazil. And my name is Nancy Rivas. I am originally from Mexico. Uh, my name is Jordana. I'm from Brazil also. My name is Alberto Martinez. I'm from Mexico City. And my name is Gabriela Latif, and I'm the marketing and events coordinator here at Latin Startups. I am from Indonesia. I am not uh, Latin American at all. <laughs> <laughs> I do get a lot of questions from one. My name is Gabriela. Uh, my name is Miriam Lazarte. I'm the CEO of Latam Startups. And uh, Latam Startups started in 2016 as a nonprofit organization. And at that time, really, uh, we didn't have like a big group and a, a big team. Uh, we started with the minimum uh, number of people around and lots of volunteers. And today, we're very proud to have uh, you know 16 people working directly with us. With five uh, members as core of the organization. I love the experience because we have uh, the opportunity to be uh, in charge and to understand better how the, the business works, the entire world. Um, having the opportunity to actually, for the first time in, in my professional career, organize and manage and putting together a focus group, I think it's been quite an experience. <laughs> their perspectives from the different cultures, their business ideas and tapping into their minds are just amazing. They have this amazing, amazing ideas. And I get to pick up a few languages along the way. So <laughs> I started to um, learn Portuguese from yeah. them as well <laughs> because I hear it every day at the office, also Spanish. We have become like a really strong team. I think like let's uh, give a lot of opportunity to people because we have a lot of volunteers yeah. so they can like uh, start to work in the business. Uh, as a first experience, I think it's it's wonderful. I am very proud of this group. I'm very proud of my people. Uh, they are all newcomers. They are all representative of um, uh, you know minorities uh, in our community, and we are working for international tech companies uh, to help them to enter to Canada. Working with LATAM, uh, it's been an amazing experience. I feel very lucky to have this opportunity. I think we would definitely recommend um, anyone to work with LATAM startups to gain, again, like experience in working in Canada, this culture and intelligence, because you'll be working with people from all over the world, <laughs> which yeah. is amazing. So today, uh, you know, under COVID-19, we changed the perspective of LATAM startups and we started to, instead of have just volunteers, hire them as part of our team. And we hope to continue with that in the next three years. And we hope to continue bringing more companies, not just from Latin America, but also from emerging countries uh, in other parts of the world. To get to know a lot of companies from all over the world with different products and most of them with the incredible capabilities to actually grow in the Toronto ecosystem. Um, so I'm very proud that, uh, you know, at this point, we have a very uh, unique team that with all the diversity and all the experience that they are bringing to the community, we really, really are making a difference in the ecosystem. Ooh, okay. Nice. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. And hello, everyone. Uh, so good to see every uh, single person attending this event. This is our last event of the year. My name is Miriam Lazarte. I'm the CEO of Latam Startups. And it's a pleasure to be with all of you here. Uh, so today we have a very exciting event, two hours event that uh, we are going to have with different startups and keynotes and uh, people around the ecosystem that we really, really uh, love to have them here. And of, of course, welcome everyone around the world that, that is uh, looking at this event. Thank you so much. I see that some of you are in different time zones and I know that this uh, may be uh, too late, you know, in different areas. So really thank you for that. Uh, first of all, I'd like to thank you, uh, to thank uh, all our sponsors, because um, this year has been an incredibly uh, challenging year, uh, you know, for many companies. We are very um, um, lucky 
to have the support of different type of sponsors that had been, uh, you know, with our community for a while. Uh, so I would like to thank uh, City of Toronto, Startup Here Toronto, OCL Law, Kingston Economic Development Corporation, Tech Place, uh, Bright Immigration, Megaphone, Bala Group. Uh, they are our main sponsors right now. Uh, so we are also, uh, you know, going to have 11 companies pitching today. And uh, we are very excited about that. But we also have two keynote speakers, Osani Sinak and Yuri Navarro. So I'm going to be, uh, you know, basically introducing them when it's time to introduce them. But right now, I uh, our four first companies pitching today. And please remember that you guys can vote and go to the poll. Uh, you can vote for the best pitch of, of the night. Uh, of course, we are going to have a winner at the end. Uh, we have uh, four judges, so we are uh, looking forward to hear who is going to be the winner. But for now, I'm going to uh, invite Saurab uh, Ringwa. He is a co-founder of a Foodbot. Uh, this is a company from Mexico, and he's going to be here joining us uh, to present uh, his company. So in a few seconds, he is going to show up. <laughs> Sometimes he kind of... Uh, you know, uh, delays a little bit, but he's going to be here. And Thank after you. him, uh, we're going to have another three companies. Hello, everyone. Hey, everyone. I'm Sarab from Foodbot. We help restaurants get more revenue and loyal customers using chatbots. So the problem that we identified in third-party apps own the customer relationship and data at the expense of restaurants. There is no way for the restaurants to interact with their customers once they leave the restaurant. So, and the loyalty and the CRM solutions in the market are either expensive apps or ANSI low customer adoption because the customer either has to install a new app or carry a new physical card with him. And because of these three major reasons, the restaurants don't have enough data and insights about their customers to run optimized campaigns on social media. So the solution that we're providing here is the complete growth tool for restaurants using chatbots. We deploy a customer-centric customer uh, rewards program on messaging app where the customer is already present, which allows restaurants to have 24-7 availability to respond to the customer and also initiate a conversation with their customers, which helps them retain and uh, develop loyal relationship with the customers. And drive more new and repeat customer businesses through targeted ad and follow-up messages. So some of the core features of our platform is we help restaurants track ad spends, track revenue in-store and uh, online on e-commerce. We help them run a loyalty program, online ordering on messaging apps and web, do smart follow-ups based on the events and behavior of the customer, take reservations, and with all this data, we pushed all this data back into their Facebook and Google ad accounts so that they can optimize their campaigns using this data. So the market, talking about market size, is pretty big. Uh, in Canada itself, we have around 100K restaurants, of which 65,000 have a Facebook page. And we aim to have 2,000 subscription by end of 2022. With a $97 Canadian dollar monthly subscription fee, we uh, aim to have 2.5 ARR million dollar ARR by end of 2022. So the traction so far is we incorporated around two years ago, it's 22 months right now. And we, be, we were in, incubated by Tech Launchpad, which is a launch uh, incubator from University of Tech de Monterrey, a premier institute from Mexico. And right now we are part of Latin Startups to help us get into Canadian market. On the channels, we already support WhatsApp, Facebook Messenger, and Instagram. We are working on Apple Business Chat integrations to allow interaction on uh, iMessage. On the POS, we integrate with most of the POS in uh, the popular POS in Mexico market, which is Soft Restaurant and ICG and Odoo. We are looking at integrating with Touch Bistro and Lightspeed to get into Canadian market. On the clients, we have 350 locations using our platform right now with Labora, Santa Salitas, Gongchas as premium brands. And our go-to market strategy and pricing is to have a forever free plan for our clients to try out our services with no restriction on the features, but only limitation being 30 orders per month. Once they start getting more than 30 orders, they switch to a pro plan, which is 97 Canadian dollar per month per location, where we also give them a monthly consultation call to help them understand how to use their data and optimize their campaigns. 
Thank you so much, you so much uh, uh, that uh, was Sarah uh, presenting his company uh, from Mexico, uh, from actually from Guadalajara. <laughs> uh, I'm going to enter the next participant is Rashid. Uh, he come from Kazakhstan. His company is Webcasa. Welcome, Rashid. Hi. Uh, hi, my name is Rashid. Uh, nice to meet you all today. And uh, I want to present our project, uh, Spotlight. Um, so right now, small business owners uh, often have little time to handle advertising. Um, people don't trust advertising like they used to. In, in a difficult economic climate, people are more hesitant, hesitant to try something new. So our solution that we offer is a Spotlight, a user-friendly and convenient referral loyalty system. Spotlight makes life easier. Whether you're a business owner trying to expand their business in economic difficult economic climate or just someone looking for a new place to eat spot there in just a minute you can start a referral load campaign that turns your best customers into into your best advertisers or you can start receiving recommendation from your friends and get discount just for trying something new and guess what your friend gets a gift from a business they recommend once you buy it's just that easy uh just to uh show how it works let me uh, tell you a story about olivia Olivia has a home bakery. She's a passionate baker and her clients are obsessed with her incredible creations. But she would love to get new customers and Olivia tries to use digital advertising tools to spread word about her bakery. But Olivia isn't a baker. But Olivia is a baker, not a marketing expert. And she wants to focus on her baking than on advertising. Olivia has spent hundreds of dollars, but that hasn't really helped. She could get help from skilled marketing professionals, but uh, the cost is way too high for her. So Olivia heard about Spotlight and gives it a try. She created a referral link and reached some of her most loyal customers, offering them $10 reward for each new customer they introduced to her business. She even offered 10% discount to each of her <clears throat> of this new their first purchase. Uh, John uh, loves Olivia's baking and buys from her frequently. When he got her request, he was excited to tell others about it and without hesitation, send a message uh, with a link to his friends. The very next day, Olivia starts getting calls from new customers interested in her baking. And two days after, John received a $30 bonus from Olivia and decided to help her more by posting about it uh, in social media so more people could uh, find out about Olivia. Uh, Spotlight is easy to set up hassle-free loyalty system. Uh, we offer easy mode that we discussed right now. Also, we have expert mode that allows to upload the customers that you want to reach to use uh, different uh, marketing tools such as remarketing and mail. And also we have API modes for those who want to keep using their current CRMs. We offer a fresh take on cost per acquisition. So you only spend money when you make a sale and you determine the size of cashback and discount and just pay a small 495 finder fee for every new customer we bring you. Uh, talking about the opportunity, uh, advertising is a 16 billion uh, industry in Canada with over 2.5 billion uh, spent in yearly in our target industries, which are realtors, restaurants and personal care services. According to our research, 84% of these businesses don't have a referral loyalty system, but 82% uh, are willing um, to reward their customers for suggesting uh, their businesses uh, to their friends with our target market of 233,000 businesses and professionals. Uh, also, 74% of consumers are willing to actively promote a business and for four out of five people consider a recommendation from their friends enough to, to choose a business. Uh, we invite you to join our Spotlight project, uh, pilot project, and get first 10 customers of, on us. Uh, so please go to spotlight.app and let's start it. Thank you. Thank you so much, Rashid. Uh, that was Rashid from uh, Kazakhstan. Now we have another participant. Each participant has around uh, three minutes uh, to do uh, their pitch. Uh, so now we are going to have Ingrid Polony. Uh, she is uh, representing Safety Dogs. Uh, hi, Ingrid. Hi, good morning. Well, good afternoon, everyone. Where are you at? Uh, so I'm Ingrid Polony. I'm the CEO for Safety Dogs, originally from Brazil, but we are located in Vancouver right now. Uh, so I'd like to present you our company and our software as service for permits and document management. 
So basically what we do is that we remove the headaches for document management for many industries to stop paying so many high fees due to the loss of expiration dates. So if we imagine a Canadian company that has 300 locations, around 15 documents per location, they'll have at least 4,500 40, documents to manage and renew. So the problem with this market is that there's a lot of, of low productivity to manage those documents. There's loss of information with personal replacement replacement, risk control, and it's very hard to estimate the cost of future renewals, as well as there's no view from the process from start to end. So our solution comes in four pillars, uh, which is the risk management, the cost reduction, assertive management, and security, to bring it all together and give a 360 view of the process and all the steps. Uh, so basically our target and our ideal customers are companies that have a high volume of permits and documents to manage and that worry about regulatory compliance and expiring documents. So markets like real estate, uh, real, retail establishments, real estate management, and manufacturing establishments. So talking about our traction and validation, some of our clients have operation in Canada, so we are planning to use the testimonials and international success cases to establish ourselves in the Canadian market, as well as using pilots to test a platform in the in the local market and give and have feedback from local customers. So basically, giving you an idea about our competitors, uh, we have around five competitors that play in the same niche as we do. Uh, none of the softwares is really specialized in permits man management. They have other tools for document management that doesn't really give a good user experience. And there is a gap in reports and graphs in the market. So regarding our investments and use of funds, we, we don't have outside investment. We are constantly investing on the platform and within housing. And the company has, prof has had profit since the first year of operation when we started in Brazil. And this is our profile. Thank you, Miriam, for the opportunity. Thank you, Ingrid, for being here today. Uh, so that was Ingrid Polony uh, from uh, Safety Docs. And now we are going to see the last pitch before we go to our first interview uh, with Yuri Navarro. So this is Eduardo Serna uh, from CardioTrack. Hello, Eduardo. Eduardo, do you hear me? Hello, everyone. Hey. Healthcare is a real challenge in emerging countries, only, not only impacting a person's well-being, but its ecosystem. And this only affects his performance at work. Hi, I'm Eduardo Serna. I'm the CEO and co-founder of CardioTrack. We help manufacturing companies automate law requirement health screening. So what's the problem with manufacturing companies in Latin America? They are required to have a healthcare staff to monitor their employees. And that is a heavy burden. It's a time-consuming activity for those companies. And the lack of that, it only affects and could have problems and fines that can threaten productivity. So with that in mind, we created a solution. It's a simple three-step solution that consists of hardware. We place an automatic clinic kiosk at your company that gives us a compliance privacy data gathering that gives us the opportunity to provide health insights for staff. But this is only step one of our plan. What are the benefits of our solution? You get law compliance. You avoid fines and sanctions. It's a vast, very fast screening service. We can save up right now up to three hours of man hour per week per worker. You have real access to data and alert, and you can have a healthier and safer workforce. On stage one right now, we are since 2019 selling already 20, 30 deployed devices around 3,000 daily scans, not only on blood pressure men, but also infrared thermometer and breathalyzer scale. And this is a big market. Just take into consideration Mexico, Peru, and Colombia, we're talking about a 433 million opportunity. So on stage two, we know that Toronto is a tech ecosystem that we want to be participating. We want to emerge with academics, with uh, technology, with investments, with uh, incubators, so we can develop an end-to-end -end solution. So the worker, with all that data gathered, can take real empowerment of his health. We will, we're going to still continue our sales in Mexico. And by end of 2021, we will establish uh, a business development program to go to other parts of Latin America. And we're not new in this rodeo. We belong to a holding that has more than 15 years experience in health market. We have presence in 18 states of Mexico and we have the more 100, 400 more clients that impact around 800,000 people. As of the present time, we started in a soft landing program with the Burlington Economic Development Tech Place, and we are eager to participate with investors to expand our solutions to emerging markets. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Eduardo. That was really good. And uh, that was our fourth company, uh, you know, participating today. Now we are going to be in a break uh, with the first interview. And uh, this is very excited for us. Uh, you know, a lot of startups become a designated company for the startup visa program in 2019. And since then, we have been, uh, you know, adding startups, international startups into the program. Just this year, 
Uh, we have 45 startups into the whole programs, you know, from Estata, Escala Bootcamp to uh, a soft landing program and a startup visa program. Uh, right now we have around 14 uh, companies, a very high growth uh, uh, companies uh, just established in, in the startup visa program. But my point with all this is that we are going to have an interview with Yuri Navarro. Uh, Yuri is the CEO of Canada Ventures. Uh, we were very lucky uh, to have somebody that, you know, is very well knowledge about the ecosystem, about the tech ecosystem in Toronto, Manjula uh, Salbaraja. Uh, I hope that I say well the last name. Uh, Manjula is a journalist uh, for radio, uh, CBC Radio, uh, as a tech journalist. So I, I'll be pleased to present uh, right now uh, their interview, um, just in a second. And here we go. My name is Manjula Salvaraja. I'm a Toronto-based tech journalist. A welcome to this discussion that is hosted by Ladam Startups, a nonprofit accelerator in Toronto that works exclusively with international startups. Our topic today is the Startup Visa Program and the role that international startups will play in the future recovery of the economy. I am really pleased to have the perfect guest here for this topic because he's one of the architects of the Startup Visa Program. It's my pleasure to introduce uh, you to Yuri Navarro. He's the managing partner of the Canadian venture capital firm, Canada Ventures. Previously, he was CEO of the National Angel Capital Organization. And prior to that, a chief of staff at the Ministry of Economic Development and Trade in Ontario. Uh, as a founder, investor, and policymaker, Yuri has spent the last 15 years working to support the success of early stage technology companies. He has built a robust network, we should say, of over 4,000 angel investors, VCs, and family offices globally. As one of the architects of the Startup Visa Program, he's a champion of the Canadian startup ecosystem and uh, innovative models for global startup and investor communities. Yuri, such a pleasure to have you here, welcome. Thank you, Manjula. Uh, it's a pleasure to uh, be participating again at another uh, Latam Startup event. So let's start off here. I mean, maybe I know some of the people that are listening will be familiar with this, but you know, give sort of a, a quick description of what the Startup Visa Program is. Sure. Uh, yeah, for those uh, who don't know, uh, the Startup Visa Program is a program that was initially kicked off back in 2013, if I'm not mistaken, uh, by Minister uh, Jason Kenney. Um, and the purpose of the program is really to try to encourage uh, tech talent from all over the world uh, to come up here uh, to Canada to join us here and help us build uh, what is really one of the uh, fastest growing and most exciting ecosystems uh, in the world, in my opinion. What does it offer international entrepreneurs? Yeah, so the Startup Visa program is uh, mainly focused around uh, helping to support the immigration component of bringing your business to Canada. Um, so uh, I should Say that it is definitely intended to be a business driven initiative where if you have a business uh, and you would like to either expand that or uh, in some cases move that uh, to Canada, um, the program essentially offers a fast track for entrepreneurs to be able to access permanent residency in Canada. So permanent residency of course being similar to kind of a green card as opposed to a visa. Um, and uh, what the program does is that if a qualified entrepreneur uh, can essentially receive uh, the blessing or the sponsorship of a uh, designated uh, organization, uh, which tends to be either a, a VC firm, an angel group, or an incubator or accelerator. Um, once that, uh, that uh, sponsorship is given to the entrepreneur, then they're able to essentially bring up up to five team members, uh, uh, presumably important team members, founders, uh, this kind of thing, and their families uh, to Canada on a permanent residency. Um, when it launched uh, back in 2013, I think they were looking at about a six month turnaround time, although maybe you know, that may, may be closer to six to 12 months uh, these days, um, but, uh, but that is the program. So it is actually quite a, quite a fast uh, turnaround uh, compared yeah. to sort of other, other avenues. Um, why is this program important uh, for Canada, especially given that, you know, we are going to need um, some kind of a recovery post-pandemic? What is the role that, that this program can play in Canada? 
Yeah, I think I think rightly so. The Canadian government has been focusing a lot of energy on the technology sector uh, as a driver for economic growth into the future. I mean, this is happening before the pandemic. Uh, the growth of the ecosystem was happening before the pandemic, and even um, you know that trend of, of seeing uh, more and more entrepreneurs coming to Canada to build their business here was something that we were seeing uh, before the pandemic. But now that uh, this has happened, and now that we're in the situation uh, where we're having to, having to rethink our, our economic strategy of the country. I think the government is definitely looking at this as one of the avenues that they hope to generate uh, significant uh, economic growth uh, and, and jobs uh, creation. And part of that is because technology companies you know, tend to be globally focused companies. They, they, they sell uh, often all over the world, definitely outside of Canada, in addition to kind of whatever they might be doing inside of Canada. Um, you know, the, the, the fact that we have such a great relationship with so many different countries from a trading perspective, especially the U.S., uh, really makes Canada an attractive uh, place for these businesses to launch, uh, a place where you have a, a higher standard of living, um, where you have access to talent, um, you know, very friendly immigration uh, rules, and uh, and that really, um, you know, helps to uh, make it easier to build your business and, and to focus on building business. So now, well, you've seen, obviously, some um, some entrepreneurs that have come through this program. Can you walk us through a, a success story or two? Yeah, there's a there's a few uh, that I'm aware of uh, that have come through the Star Visa program. Probably the one that most people kind of point to is the Huzza story. Mm -hmm. um, so Huzza uh, was a company, I believe, out of the Ukraine that uh, that uh, had received investment from uh, one of the uh, it was one of the Angel Network uh, groups, I believe. Um, through the Star Visa program, they were brought to Canada uh, to build their businesses, and within the course of a couple of years, uh, they were actually able to successfully. Um, generated an exit for their investors uh, through acquisition. They were actually acquired uh, by Kickstarter, and, and, and just to uh, to point to kind of um, an interesting data on uh, point on this, uh, when Kickstarter acquired them, they acquired them as a way to kind of establish a presence in Canada. So um, you know, it, it's not one of those stories where um, where somebody acquired a company and then took it down south and we never saw them again. That actually resulted in jobs creation and. Um, and, and more investment happening in Canada as a result of that. So yeah, I think those kind of opportunities are, are excellent uh, for Canada, are excellent for um, the ecosystem, uh, and of course for investors. Um, so these are, you know, these are some of them, but there are many others that we've seen, um, you know, uh, entrepreneurs that have come here from, from the U.S., uh, from Europe, from Latin America, um, that have established essentially uh, their roots here. Um, you know, have brought their families, uh, set up a life for themselves, and have built companies. Uh, in many cases, have had to pivot, uh, which is typical of technology companies. Um, but, but you know, they had the chance to do that here in our ecosystem with the, all the support um, that is provided to our companies here. You know, Yuri, uh, you've mentioned a couple of reasons that that uh, companies like this with exciting ideas may be interested in Canada. I want you to dig into that a little bit. What is it that you think um, can? Because there is this global competition for talent. There's yep. a global competition for great um, ideas and, and entrepreneurial efforts that could, you know, become the next big unicorn or just the next big thing. So, so I wonder, you know, what it is that Canada specifically offers um, that could help these companies, you know, uh, build or, or scale the next big idea. Yeah. Well, I mean, uh, as a starting point, I would say that Canada is uh, probably one of the more developed ecosystems globally uh, when it comes to startups, when it comes to access to capital. Um, so this is this is really important to understand that you know Canada uh, is you know for sure the kind of the small cousin to to the U.S. when it comes to the size of the ecosystem and capital available and talent and all that kind of stuff. But for years, Canada has been punching above its weight in in this space. Um, you know, you see Canadian founders kind of littered across all of the major uh, Silicon Valley firms. Um, and, and, you know, as a result of that, we've always had a very strong relationship uh, with the tech community south of the border. Um, and, and that has more recently led to uh, almost like an erasing of the, of the border in terms of access to capital, access to customers. Um, and, and that's really been positive for, for Canada. But um, the advantage that we have in this context is that um, Canada also happens to be, uh, you know, a very stable uh, democracy. Um, a country where you know you can rely on on, on the social system for for support, things like healthcare, uh, education. Um, you know that is really provide Canadians with a higher high standard of living um, that we enjoy. And and you know this has been uh, very attractive, of course, uh, even 
some of our American cousins uh, who we've seen coming up uh, up north, uh, but you know, to people all over the world. Um, now, the the other advantage that Canada has vis-a-vis -vis our, our our cousins to the south is that you know, uh, despite kind of having these benefits um, and and this connectivity, we actually tend to have a, a lower cost of, of talent, lower cost of living uh, in in our major ecosystems like Toronto, Montreal, and Vancouver and Waterloo. Uh, by comparison to you know the big ecosystems in the U.S. like Austin, uh, Silicon Valley, uh, Seattle, etc., and and what this means is that uh, you know you can essentially get a lot more bang for your buck um, being here versus uh, locating one of those markets uh, while still having access to talent, still having access to um, you know programs like IRAP and and other government subsidy programs that essentially support uh, investment in R&D and innovation. Um, so, you know, it's, it's kind of like the best of both worlds where you have, um, you know, this, this access to this massive market uh, to our south, but, but at the same time, uh, some advantages with regards to cost, um, you know, standard living for, for employees, immigration policies, etc. Now, you know, no policy. I, I know that you were around and you were part of the team that founded this idea, the Startup Visa Program, but no policy is perfect. What are some of the issues with the program? Yeah, so I, I, I've long been a big believer in the program. Um, you know, we when when the government decided to do this, it was at the uh, advice of, of uh, a number of industry leaders from the community. Um, you know, the 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 reason being that these industry leaders wanted to bring talent here uh, and wanted a better way to kind of get that talent um, into Canada without having to uh, take years and years of, of queue processing for uh, for those immigration applications. Um, you know, the reality is that what the government did was to create a program that is industry led, uh, which, you know, is, is unique, I would think, for any immigration program out there. Um, this means that the industry has a voice and has a say uh, in choosing which companies are a good fit for the program and, and which should be immigrated. Um, this gives a tremendous amount of power to, to the venture capital firms, angel groups and incubators and accelerators that have been, um, you know, working to, to help build up our, our technology pool and our talent pool here in Canada. Um, having said that, um, you know, uh, as with many things, sometimes there is a, a misalignment uh, on that can make things a little bit more difficult than it could otherwise be. Uh, in the case of the Startup Visa Program, it has to do with resources. So, um, you know, there's just so much interest uh, from so many entrepreneurs from all over the world. Uh, literally, uh, we, at least when I was in Banco, we were seeing hundreds of applications uh, coming into each of the designated entities every year. Um, this can sometimes be overwhelming for, you know, an independent uh, entity, uh, you know, for example, working um, in, a, in a smaller community where they're not used to seeing that kind of volume of, of applications. Um, so this, this really uh, created a bit of a bottleneck, um, not necessarily within the government, although, you know, there's always those issues uh, on processing times and those kind of things with the government, but it also created a bottleneck um, in terms of the, the ability of the designated organizations to, to process deal flow and respond in a timely manner to entrepreneurs. Um, it really just made for a, a worse um, experience. I, I think of this as a user experience problem. Uh, it made a worse user experience for the average entrepreneur that wanted to apply. And, uh, and of course, that's in the process too, right? I mean, yeah. you, you well, want it, this to be fast. You want this to be six months and suddenly. Yeah, well, there's a pre-step, right? Yeah, exactly. So there's a six months uh, to, the, to the application process once you get in. But getting into that application process can take uh, a really long time, uh, even just to get the attention of one of these designated entities. Um, so that that you know that obviously created some challenges, and it's not um, for for lack of desire. I mean, I think many of the designated entities would love to be able to host uh, some of these entrepreneurs in in their uh, communities, but um, you know they have to be able to find the right uh, people and 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 right fit with their community. And uh, this takes time. Uh, getting to know these companies takes a lot of time. And, and in some cases, these organizations just were not set up for uh, being able to look abroad. And so, you know, organizations like uh, Latam Startups, who are specifically looking abroad, or uh, in our case, uh, our fund, uh, Canada.bc, uh, we're specifically looking abroad and trying to support um, these organizations. Um, you know, we're trying to help overcome those barriers and, and make sure that, uh, you know, good entrepreneurs that want to come and build companies here in Canada can, can have a faster path towards that. So, you know, here you were, you were at the start of the program, you've seen some things that have, you know, succeeded and, and maybe slowed down in the program uh, in turn. What are you trying to do differently with the program now? Yeah, so, um, so you know, to, to a large extent, I, I, I feel that, 
there is an opportunity to be had still with the program. Um, you know, there are, like I mentioned, there are many uh, great entrepreneurs out there that would love to come uh, to Canada and, and uh, build a life for themselves while they're building their startup here. In many cases, um, you know, those companies have already business interests in North America and, and would like to expand on that North American presence. Canada is just a fantastic place to do that. And so, um, you know, the reality is that uh, it, sometimes in order to do that, it seems easy enough uh, when you're thinking about it. But, uh, you know, there are practical realities of getting on the ground, getting to set up with a business um, and having partners in place that, that can help support that is, is a huge advantage. Um, you know, if you're going to be making that migration and taking that risk. Uh, what we've been doing with Canada Ventures is essentially uh, trying to fix, uh, we say trying to fix start a visa program uh, from a few standpoints. The, the first one is uh, we're trying to make sure that any qualified entrepreneur that would like to come to Canada has a pathway to access the designated entities um, and, and get their attention. Uh, so we, we and a designated entity would be would be an organization that has been approved by the government, like that and startups too. Yes, exactly, exactly. And so what we're trying to do is help uh, kind of triage the front end of that deal. But, um, you know, work with the uh, designated organizations in partnership um, to help them sort through uh, the volume of applications that they're receiving. Uh, and be able to identify the ones that make the most sense for them. Uh, so we're helping to support them and provide extra capacity to due diligence uh, on the company's fraud to uh, match these companies to the right organizations. And uh, and so through that, we're trying to unlock uh, one one deadlock, which is uh, you know getting the attention of the right organizations. Um, beyond that, um, you know we're big believers in this market uh, and the access that you have in Canada. Uh, to the broader North American market. So we're really razor focused on trying to help these companies once they land here uh, to generate sales and replicate the success from back home in this market. Uh, so, you know, uh, obviously we we uh, require a certain amount of, uh, of development uh, for us to work with companies. They need to have a product. They need to have something that they're selling already uh, that we can help them sell here in this market. But our goal is really to align our interests with them and, and help them sell that. Um, and not do it in, you know, uh, from a fee-based standpoint, but rather as an investor. Um, so, you know, kind of when we work with the company, we invest our own time and energy and, and all the capital into those companies, and then uh, really try to help them uh, generate that sales, generate, you know, the validation that they need in this market to be able to raise around and, and be successful here. Um, and then, as we kind of follow their progress, we invest. So, you know, I'm going to ask you um, about uh, what it takes to craft a successful application. But before we get to that, I'm curious as to what makes for an ideal candidate? Yeah, so for, for us, um, you know, we're really looking for uh, great technology companies. Um, we're specifically looking for uh, uh, business facing companies. So B2B, SaaS, enterprise. Mm -hmm. um, in our case, uh, our partners are not exclusively looking at that. So sometimes we'll refer uh, companies to the designated entities uh, that don't necessarily meet our funds requirements, but we'll still kind of help support those companies through and help support the, the function with the designated entities. Uh, but for our fund, we're specifically looking for, uh, you know, enterprise facing companies that uh, hopefully are already selling in North America. But even if they're not, as long as they have some traction uh, in their market, they have a product, they've sold it in their market to corporates in their market. Um, we, we help to get them here uh, and help them to replicate that. So typically we're looking for a certain amount of, of revenue, uh, a certain amount of traction uh, in terms of um, you know, customer traction. Uh, we're looking for companies, of course, to have a bit of runway uh, as well. Uh, so understanding that one of the things that companies are going to come here for is fundraising. Uh, we want to make sure that they have a chance to get landed uh, and, and you know, execute on that initial kind of soft landing before um, they need to kind of go and raise around, so that gives them the time to establish their credibility in the marketplace. Um, so these things are all uh, all really important to us. And then, um, you know, finally, we we're looking for ambitious uh, entrepreneurs. So we're looking for people that want to build big global businesses. Um, so you know, uh, not to say that there's anything wrong with small businesses, but uh, but for the purpose of our fund, uh, we require that uh, their ambitions be aligned with ours, and and that they uh, that, that they're really shooting to do something. Um, world class. So the rocket. Okay. Um, so let's get to that question of you know how, you know we know that we're going to have some uh, entrepreneurs here listening. You know, give us some tips on what it takes to craft a successful application. What do you think should go into that? Yeah, I think um, 
So you know, you know, the important things to understand is that you're kind of looking uh, and speaking to different audiences uh, when you're doing this. So this isn't uh, you know a typical kind of business plan uh, kind of situation in, in many cases. Um, you know, to be successful, first you have to be able to um, meet the requirements of the designated entity. So you have to know carefully which designated entities are a good fit for the kind of business that you have. Um, so, you know, some designated entities may be uh, supportive of, of locally focused businesses or, um, or you know, uh, certain industries, uh, whereas other designated entities may be more specifically looking for, uh, like you're saying, rocket ships or uh, deep technology companies. Um, so understanding your audience, just like anything else, making sure you understand who you're talking to and what they're looking for and, and not just applying uh, uh, blindly to every, uh, every entity out there just to try to see what sticks. That's very rarely uh, going to be uh, successful. Uh, really, what needs to happen is you need to have a, a dedicated and focused approach on on you know get to know uh, your your partners here. So if you're applying to, to be accepted by Disney, then you get to know them, get to know what they what they like, um, what they typically invest their time and energy into, so that you can align with that. And then finally, on the government side of things, um, you know it's really important that things be straightforward. Um, so with the government. Um, you know, anytime you have the government trying to understand business, uh, we can get into some tricky uh, situations. Um, you know, anything that kind of looks uh, a bit off, uh, looks uncommon, is going to naturally raise questions. Um, and so, you know, try to make sure that that you know your your house is in order, that your term sheets are clean, and and your cap table is clean, and and uh, that you have a great business that you're trying to start, and and, and the, the paperwork kind of reflects that. Um, and uh, yeah, and you know, I, I one piece of advice I would have on that is that you know it's 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 more important that you have a great technology company um, that you know has great ambitions and, and makes sense in this market um, than uh, and to say how much money do you have in the bank account or um, or uh, you know uh, what what is your business done uh, in its home market uh, really for it to be a fit for this uh, for this program you have to show what you're trying to do in this market. So this is uh, also important. Now it must be actually just as on a final note, it must be lovely for you to be working with this program after being one of the people that uh, that created it. Was it what is it like for you to know that this could play a part in in uh, the econo uh, economic recovery of the country? Yeah, I mean, I think um, on a personal you know, note, that is, yeah, yeah, yeah. No, on a personal note, I mean, I think, I think, you know, part of the reason why uh, I've always been a big champion of this program and and supportive of it is because. I saw the opportunity for it to, to play a significant role in in the building of, of Canada's uh, ecosystem and, and, and infrastructure, if you want to think of it in that way, uh, for the startup community. Um, you know, I, I really uh, would love to see uh, more of it, actually, and that's part of the reason why I'm investing time and energy um, to build a model that you know tries to align interests and tries to make sure that um, we're solving some of the challenges that the program has had. So, from 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 a personal standpoint, it's obviously. Um, uh, it's exciting and and uh, um, ultimately rewarding to kind of know that something that I've done in the past uh, uh, still has potential to have even more impact than it has had so far, and uh, and that I can have a, a, a small kind of piece in, in pushing it in the right direction is uh, is incredibly rewarding. That's great. That's great. Well, congratulations, Julian. Thank you. Thank you for for taking the time to sit down with me. I appreciate it. Ayuri uh, Navarro is the managing partner of the Canadian venture capital firm, uh, Canada Ventures, and one of the architects of the Startup Visa program. You can find out more information about his firm at canada.bc. And for more information on the Startup Visa program or our host, uh, Latham Startups, uh, please visit latamstartups.org. Thank you. So that was the interview with Yuri Navarro. I uh, really enjoyed that interview. And Yuri is here with us uh, for a Q&A. Uh, so guys, if you have questions for Yuri, this is the time because he's entering right now. And uh, uh, you know, we were talking about the Startup Visa program and he is uh, going to uh, perhaps answer some of your questions 
uh, in regards also uh, investment and uh, uh, you know in the in the program. So while he's connecting with us, uh, that he will be uh, here very soon. Uh, I would just would like to uh, thank uh, Manjula for uh, for the great job uh, interviewing Yuri. And here we have Yuri. Hey, Yuri. Thank you so much for connecting. Yeah, no, happy to be here and uh, answer questions. Um... Yeah. Yuri, uh, one of uh, our first questions I will say regarding the Stata Visa program is, uh, you know, uh, now uh, we we see a lot of excitement, uh, you know, in the community because of the vaccine, and it seems like things are getting better for 2021. Uh, what are you expecting from investment firms that are linked with a startup visa program in regards of bringing startups to to the country? Yeah, well, I think uh, so. To be clear, we haven't really let um, kind of everything that's happening with uh, COVID nineteen affect us in terms of uh, our plans, uh, and and so we're actively processing companies every week. Um, you know, we have uh, quite a few that have already applied that we're working with, um, and and so that that hasn't impacted us. Um, I'm not sure about the others. What it has impacted, of course, is uh, processing times, unfortunately. So uh, right now, uh, the government uh, has been mostly kind of on a work from home situation. Uh, and as you can imagine, like with anybody else, uh, that's impacted their ability to uh, turn around some of these files, especially uh, you have to understand immigration files are sensitive. Um, so, so, you know, the, the pandemic has kind of delayed things and, and extended timelines. Um, also, of course, uh, difficult to get in the country if the border is closed. Uh, so even if you get approved, uh, getting here is a little bit more difficult right now, but that doesn't necessarily um, impact uh, your ability to come. It's just a matter of timing, uh, you know, when there are flights uh, between the countries, when the, we're accepting new uh, people to the country. Uh, but I think it's a matter of time and, and, you know, with the vaccines and everything else coming out, I really think that uh, it's a matter of, of months um, that, uh, that we'll be able to do that. Um, I think there was a conversation that, um, you know, in the early part of next year, we should have the first few batches going out here in Canada and, and the first few uh, people getting immunized. So, um, yeah, I think things are going in the right direction. Thank you for that. And actually, we have been working as many other organizations online, you know, um, bringing these startups uh, somehow when they finish, you know, the, the process, basically. Um, Judy, uh, there is an interesting question here and is uh, in regards of uh, students that are in the country that perhaps international students can become a part of the startup visa program. Um, like, how do you see that really working for them? Uh, there, there are people here commenting that perhaps, uh, you know, that uh, some other people have said that uh, they, they need to go for work permit first and all do that. Uh, students that become entrepreneurs, international students, do you see that as a possibility? Uh, I don't know why they would need to go for a work permit personally. <laughs> uh, I, again, you know, I guess different people give different advice, but uh, my understanding is that they don't. Um, so there, there are comp different complexities with international students depending on the type of permit that they have. Uh, I'm not an immigration expert uh, by any means, but what I will say is that uh, the startup visa does, does come with the work permit. So, um, you know, you, you would get the work permit once you apply to the startup visa if you're eligible for it. Um, a different question might be whether uh, a work permit might be faster to get or quicker to get than to go through the entire startup visa process. Um, and, and so that's that's another question. Um, so maybe the, the advice is coming from a different standpoint. Uh, in terms of students, no, we, we definitely are open to students that have startups here. Uh, again, you know, we are looking for certain kinds of startups. Uh, in our case, uh, designated entities have different criteria uh, and requirements, but there's nothing wrong with students uh, that are already here, that are already building a business uh, to apply. Um, I think even uh, if I'm not mistaken, I had heard that uh, the requirement to leave the country, uh, given the circumstances, has been waived in in, in recent uh, uh, months. Uh, so so you know, um, there's really no uh, nothing stopping a, a student from applying, except that of course you have to find a designated entity that can sponsor you, that is aligned with what your company is doing and interested in, in hosting you. Uh, Jerry, we have another question here. Uh, what about entrepreneurs that have great ideas and willing to start new businesses directly in Canada? Uh, do you think that startups, uh, a part of the startup visa program, should have already traction in their country so they can start brand new here in Canada with something, uh, you know, from? 
Yeah, so there's nothing stopping uh, a company uh, that has an idea, um, you know, wanting to wanting to come here. Um, the question I think that they should be asking though is how likely are they to be successful? Um, so, so you know, the part of the problem with starting a new company is that it's very hard to start a new company. There's a lot of instability in starting a new company, um, and and you know, similarly, it's very hard to move to a new country. Um, you know, let's let's not. Uh, um, glaze over it at all, uh, going to a brand new country and, and making new connections and, and gaining uh, understanding of the ecosystem of business practices of, of uh, you know, who the, who the co key contacts are for your industry. All that is very difficult to do. It usually takes years to do, uh, unless if you have a partner that can help you navigate that system. And, uh, and so it's, you know, um, I would say that the concern that I would have, and maybe this is something for the startup to think about, uh, if you're thinking of going somewhere to start a new business is, you know, why not start it in your home country? Because um, you're just compiling more more risk on top of uh, your business if you're moving to a new country and starting a new company all at the same time. Um, so the, the best thing to do is actually to build a company where you are, uh, you know, prove the model, gain some traction. And then uh, when you're ready, take the risk of moving to a new country. Um, because if you weren't able to do it at home, um, you know, the chances that you'll be able to kind of do it in a new country um, where you have less resources at your disposal is, is uh, I would say, quite low. Uh, we are going to have two more questions and then we move on with the, uh, with the event. Uh, so we have another question here. Uh, do you see private equity investors as an active part of the startup uh, investor base? Increasingly so. Generally speaking, no. Um, typically, private equity has a real hard time uh, doing small checks. So when you're thinking about startups, you're thinking about small checks, you're thinking about small rounds, you know, um, million dollars, five hundred thousand dollars, three million dollars. Uh, later stage companies do raise more. The 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 more uh, they raise, and the later they get in their development, and and the lower the risk becomes. You see private equity starting to dabble a bit uh, in there. Um, what you are starting to see a bit more is family offices, which sometimes get confused with private equities. Uh, fi family offices are, are um, sometimes larger than private equity firms and sometimes smaller than private equity firms. But the good thing about fam family offices is that they can do whatever they want. Um, so you do sometimes see family offices getting involved in the startup ecosystem. And I see that especially in Latin America uh, quite a bit. Um, private equity, though, is professional management, and usually they're looking to buy existing companies with millions of dollars in revenue where they think there's an opportunity to, you know, cut the fat and, and uh, refine the company in a way that can generate a profit, and, and they have bosses too. So they don't get to do what they want. They have specific mandates. And the last question is actually from our friend Manjula, <laughs> who interviewed you. Uh, she's asking if there are any particular sectors within the tech that uh, have higher chance uh, than others. Well, I mean, that changes all the time. So right now, uh, given the pandemic, everybody's talking about work from home. Everybody's talking about health, uh, uh, health care, um, you know, uh, even even like all aspects of health care, including like in-home fitness is booming right now. Um, you know, the, the uh, logistics business has been disrupted t tremendously uh, and needs some help. Um, you know, even, even finance, um, you know, the traditional, any, any business that has a traditional experience that has not been disrupted by this, it's causing people to think about um, not just COVID as being a one-off thing, but actually uh, a future world where we can be better prepared to deal with these kinds of situations when they happen again, because they probably will happen again. Um, and so uh, there's a ton of opportunity out there. Um, in terms of Canada, Canada has a lot of strength in AI, in SaaS, in B2B. Um, you know, these are areas that are very strong for us. Digital marketing, um, you know, the, these are the things that Canada does really well. Um, you know, not to say that they don't do other things well, but, but uh, that's where like the majority of the talent and resources and, and the investors are mostly focused on. Um, fintech is another uh, pretty good one that we have here blockchain this kind of thing yeah hey, thank you so much for joining us today and for the wonderful interview as well manjula hey <laughs> uh, thank you so much for that and uh, jury if you want to stay a little bit more great uh we are going to continue presenting the startups thank you so much for helping us <laughs> okay no worries thanks a lot for having me thank you
Uh, so guys, we are going to continue because we have more companies that are going to present today. Uh, so I saw um, a few more questions there. Uh, I'm hoping that, you know, Juri is a very busy guy. Uh, I'm hoping that he will uh, answer some of the questions if he can. But if not, you know, um, you can always think. Um, I know that there are uh, some other people also that you can connect here about Estera Visa program in particular. If you are looking for immigration processes, Blaine Kumar is here uh, from uh, Bright Immigration, so you will find him around. He is, uh, he's actually participating in the, in the event as a judge. And we have also Alan Ociel from Ociel Law uh, participating for those that are looking for uh, options to incorporate in Canada. So those are our sponsors uh, for, for the program. But I'm going to continue, uh, continue with another four companies. And please uh, be actively vote, voting for, for the best company uh, or best pitch, uh, the, the one that you like the most. Uh, so we are going to continue uh, with the next one is Ashkan. Uh, Ashkan, I believe, is here. Um, just one second. I just want to make sure that I have the right person here. <laughs> so Ashkan, um, I'm going to add you to the call right now so you can in, you can present okay uh ashkan is representing uh smart dent and his company is original from iran thank you hello everyone so i'm just can you see my screen is it starting to share yes okay uh, we are smart dent a revolution in digital dentistry. More patients, less documentations for doctors. We have a diverse team from healthcare professionals to tech people to sales with a combined 40 years of research experience. And four out of the five co-founders for Canada are, they have PhDs. We are partnered with ACFA, all in Europe and Japan. What problem we are trying to solve? The technician gets the image, the doctors look at it, the assistant type it, and the doctor is going to sign it. This is a time consuming process and it is failed to identify the problems in the X-ray and errors and mistakes happen in the process. We are automating this process all the way from automa automatic data uh, image acquisition from the device and then processing the image, finding the anomalies in the image, writing the report and pushing the report to the doctor's iPad or desktop for signing and reviewing. The healthcare AI market size is growing rapidly. It, it was 0.62 billion in 2018, and it is going to hit 31.3 billion by 2025. And we are targeting for 300 million of this market. So we are saving time, increasing the revenue and improving the patient satisfaction for dental clinics. We are saving $2,600 for each dentist in a month. Market tractions, we have over 300 paying customers, three international partners and 10 plus universities are collaborating with us. Regarding the sales, we are leveraging the partnership with large distributors in North America, including Henry Shine. We have a B2B solution with our partners, with three of them already in place. We, have a, we are targeting our customers through digital marketing, as well as more traditional channels like attending exhibitions. Regarding the competition, we have few competitors in North America. And we have our, our competitive point, our, our proprietary algorithm, which uses deep data, deep learning, deep discovery, or image acquisition um, from the imaging device, which is called DICOM. The integration technology we have with the uh, clinic management software through in-house developed twin and human readable uh, report generation capability. One head-to-head -head comparison with our main competitor, Orca Dental AI. We have twin DICOM and report generation as a priority, as a superior technology than our competitor. So what we are looking for, partnership with insurance companies, 
clinic management softwares as well as more medical clinics and universities to offer our technology. Regarding the patents, we have two patents already registered, one patent in the process and all the IP will be transferred to our Canadian company. We uh, validated our technology in, through a focus group in Canada and US. So the product is validated, customers concern, addressed, and letter of intents, uh, like three letter of intents so far received two from Canada and one from the United States. Thank you for your attention. And thank you, Ashkan, for joining us today. Uh, that was great we have presentation as well. So we are going to continue with Ed Moraes. Ed comes from Brazil, and he is representing Plugin City. Uh, actually, currently, Ed is in Vancouver, uh, but his team is in Brazil, so well. Hi, Miriam. Hello. Thank you for the opportunity. So I'm sharing my screen over here. Hello, everyone. I'm Ed Moraes, and with Claudio and Alexandre, who is here, we are the co-founders of Plugin CD. And I have a question for you today. Who among us is missing travel, meeting people, and trying new experience? People are craving new ways to experience restaurants and exchange ideas with new friends from around the world without, leaving, without having to travel. And restaurants want to use technology to explore new revenue streams and reach a global customer base. Two problems, one solution, a mobile app that brings together the people who want to enjoy the experience and the restaurants who want to reach those people from anywhere in the world. The market size of this industry is estimated in 1.5 US trillion and includes from restaurants and bars to coffee shops and breweries. Traditional experience apps like Meetup, TripAdvisor and Airbnb are now trying to pivot to online experience and they didn't find a solution yet. Airbnb, for example, the biggest one, it still offers only 50 online experience globally. This is a small number considering the amount of online ex offline experience they used to have. And we believe we know how to do the difference. We are gonna be focused on venues as hosts and their experts. Chefs cooking with people or even brewmasters creating new beers from, with guests from all over the world. And guests will be able to enjoy experience and they also will have an option to get special and curated kits with products from those venues. With the same experience portfolio, we will also be able to capture B2B market and corporate companies can use it as gifts or for team buildings. From each transaction, we will have a 20% commission. The host set the price and what will be included. Again, a new revenue stream for the venues. That's our main difference. This is how our app looks like. Pick a city, see information about the venues, choose a day and a special kit with products to be delivered to your place. Pay and receive instructions on how to connect by video and audio with an expert from a very interesting spot. And we are already having people exploring this experience. For example, in Brazil, most famous chef, Alex Atala, has cooked live with 25 guests, two hours interacting by video and audio, and more than 200 people in the waiting list of each available date. Was a really success. This show how our idea is validated. More than 500 guests have already experienced and 15 hosts are registered with us right now. We are in the accelerate process. Canada will be our target market, and we are now getting venues in Vancouver to be part of the platform. And in 20 months, we are planning to reach more than 60 cities and 200, 1,200 venues, including Latin and North America. Here is our contact. Feel free to reach us, and thank you, thank you very much. Thank you so much, Ed. Very well done. Uh, we are going to continue our, um, you know, pitch session this time with Mauricio Lopez. Uh, Mauricio is representing representing lo, uh, role play uh, from Mexico. Mauricio. Hello, Miriam. Hello, Mauricio. So you can go ahead and share your screen. 
for sure. Hello, everybody, and thank you very much for your virtual presence. My name is Mauricio Lopez, and I will introduce Roleplay. Did you know that the training industry is valued at $370.3 billion per year? And 70% is wasted because trainees do not modify, change, or improve their skills after training sessions? That's why we created Roleplay, a cloud-based platform powered by artificial intelligence designed to provide a virtual space to train, practice, and improve communication skills. With Roleplay, the training leader assigns one or multiple activities to the users, setting the evaluation criteria and giving them recommendations of the best response. Afterwards, the users can record themselves answering to the business activity. Simultaneously, the platform evaluates the facial and voice emotions, the use of keywords, the rhythm of the speaker, as well as the transcription of the speech, providing a result and feedback at the end. Some of the great benefits of this simulator are increasing sales outcome, training available in 30 languages, creation of a coaching environment, remote learning, and finally, Roleplay complements the training strategy of companies. A very important feature when we talk about our direct competition. While they focus on offering a complete training suite that is designed to break and substitute the actual learning system, we offer a complement that can be implemented in a matter of days. Regarding costs, companies invest in training between 899 and 1,299 US dollars per employee a year. Roleplay would symbolize an investment of 180 US dollars per employee a year, making it an economically feasible option to complement the training system already in place. Roleplay can be used by anybody in any industry. Our target market is focused in the education insurance, financial, retail, automotive, and pharmaceutical industry. But our market entry strategy is to target the 928 pharmaceutical companies based in North America for two main reasons. The industry must be in continual training, and roleplay is already being used by several well-known pharmaceutical laboratories, AstraZeneca, Janssen, and Bouchel, today accumulating a base of 1,850 active trainees, ultimately proving the necessity of the tool. In order to keep growing our client base, Roleplay and the incredible team behind it is searching for business partners in the industry. Therefore, we would like to invite you to a 15-minute presentation of our potential business venture. Empower people to achieve more. Become part of the role play team. Thank you very, very much for your time. And thank you very much for the presentation. We are going uh, for the last presentation uh, of this batch. And this time we are inviting Pablo uh, de Melo, uh, representing Cloudwalk. And this company comes from Brazil. So welcome, Pablo. Thank you very much. Nice. Uh, it's really nice to be here. Um, let's share. So we are Cloudwalk. Cloudwalk, it is a fintech company created and accelerated in Silicon Valley. Uh, we have more than 70,000 Brazilian merchants. We started here in Brazil. We are changing uh, entrepreneurs, small and medium entrepreneurs' life right now. We uh, help them to sell for more than 4 million buyers, and we have a presence in more than 3,000 cities right now. Uh, the global payment industry, it is almost a 30 trillion industry in, in 2020. In Canada, if you get only Canada, it is a 10 trillion market for all payment methods. And only POS pay, payments last year, it is a billion Canadian dollars market. Uh, 
the market is dominated by four legacy merchant services, Moneris, as you know, Moneris, Global Payment, Chase, TD, other acquires owned by banks. New tech companies, they are emerging as Stripe, Square, Pay, Bright, Afterpay, Affirm, and Split It, but they are not efficient enough to compete with the biggest player for pricing installments. Cloudwalk, we do both. Both. We are a payment process, we are acquired, uh, we have the li license to be acquired, and we have buy now, pay later uh, installments possibility. And we use that unique technology developed by us to deliver the lowest cost process, processing costs in the industry with a high level of security and operational efficiency. The problem is that the payment industry around the world and, the, and Canada as well, in Canada as well, there exists an average, by now pay later, the average uh, 20% more APR uh, and require additional credit approval. It's expensive to buy some, to, to sell and buy some thing installments. We don't charge the, the final customer. The credit for them is extended by, uh, through the consumer personal credit card. Small and medium business, they are subject to high fees per transaction. We don't charge high fee per transaction, the, the small and medium business. There is, we use a low flat fee for everyone. There is a complicated price and fee structure. We, we practice a transparent price without any overcharge, monthly payments, early determination fees. And they, they are really underserved served by customer services. We do everything digitally, including uh, onboard process. We do that 24 uh, hours, seven days a week. And we, onboard, we can onboard a merchant in just uh, uh, three hours. Uh, we settle all merchants that we have in the next day. All, all of our merchants, they have a dashboards to manage receivable and payables. Uh, we, we serve them with the best transactions price and buyers can buy uh, less expensive products for them. We, uh, we have a PCI, the SES, PIN security, all uh, security st st worldwide standards for, for payment industry. We empower worldwide merchants, including Canadian merchants. We, our focus is merchants with high tech items and help them to sell in installments or, uh, or in credit. Our team, uh, we, uh, it is a very, very uh, capacitated team. We have more than 100 right now in Brazil and in Europe, in the United States. Uh, we have different uh, employees in place in the world. And we, we are supported by numerous blue ship investors, uh, Silicon Valley investors, and the biggest and one of the biggest financial companies company in the world. Thank you very much. And thank you, Pablo, for uh, uh, presenting today. So that was our last batch, uh, you know, before we go to the next interview. And I'm very pleased to have this interview here. Uh, you know, this uh, was a really fun conversation we have with Osan Isinak. So I'm going to start presenting Osan uh, as part of Keretsu Forum. He's actually here right now you know, uh, presenting uh, in the event. So he will be as well in the Q&A part. So I will start with the interview now. Hello, everyone. Uh, today, we have a special interview with Osan Isinak. And Osan has been very close to our community. He works with international startups. And it's a pleasure for us to have him here. Uh, for those that don't know Osan, Osan is an active investor and serial entrepreneur with over 25 years of international experience within the angel investment, venture capital, and private equity sectors. Uh, he was based in Silicon Valley during the uh, first dot-com boom in the uh, 1990s. And then, um, you know, he has been in different cities from San Francisco, Seattle, New York, Toronto. Uh, he's currently president, president of the Credit the world's largest uh, angel investment network operating in four countries. And the global network specializes in syndication of deals and invests over uh, 100 million into uh, 200 early stage uh, companies each year, which is amazing, Osan. Welcome to this interview. Thank you very much. Thank you for having me, Mayim. Yeah, to nice to see you. Mm -hmm. uh, so, Osan, the first question is related, of course, with the pandemic and COVID-19. 
kind of this has, uh, you know, hit all type of businesses around the world. And uh, startups in particular are afraid of angel investment is going to go away for the next couple of years. Um, right. So what do you think people should expect in, in regards of angel investors and how angel investors are going to react to post-COVID crisis? All right. Uh uh, it's. I mean, it's. It's actually pretty natural to be a little, uh, little worried or anxious. Uh, you know, given that these are these are you know unexpected times. Um, I guess there are a couple of things that you need to look at. Um, there, the, the competitiveness. Uh, the, the, the capital markets are very competitive right now. Uh, the biggest issues that we're seeing is that there are, uh, the valuations have been rising over the past five to ten years. Um, and and there may be a bit of a correction, specifically on the VC front. Uh, we're seeing that there's certain down rounds that are that are happening, and you know what a down round is basically you're you're raising capital on a valuation that's lower than what you offered to your previous set of investors, which is uh, which is a very very uh, negative. It can have a very negative impact uh, on your company and in your future uh, future funding rounds. That's what we're seeing, uh, and that's that's that's. Uh, it could be very, uh, uh, it could be very uh, um, <laughs> unnerving. Uh, you know, you keep your uh, investors happy. Uh, you know, a happy investor is a happy company. <laughs> uh, right. Happy future round, um, and and work with the investors. Now, uh, everybody, as an investor, you don't want the company, your portfolio company, to fail. Uh, so you want to support them. Uh, support them. In potentially, you know, uh, doubling down on certain rounds, helping them instead of raising fresh new capital from fresh investors at a down round, try to see if you can, you know, circle back to your existing investors and say, hey, you know what, this is this is where the gap is, and we need to fill it. Whether that's a capital gap or whether that's a, uh, you know, uh, a networking, business development, product development, etc., you really need to kind of. Uh, use every tool in your toolbox at this point, you know, just at least over the next year or so until yeah. things go back. Uh, also, I mean, but that's where, for example, for uh, startups that already have some rounds in investment, what about those that are just starting to raise money? So they shouldn't expect much, I guess. No, 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 no. We're investing. <laughs> we continue to invest, uh, Miriam. We continue to invest in new companies. Uh, but uh, it, it's, we, we because we found that companies would come to us with uh, unrealistic valuations, now you know this is this is a moment where, uh, at least for the next six months or so, uh, it's uh, the the leverage is with the investor rather than the company, right? Uh, so you just need to make sure uh, you're prepared. And uh, and and I've said this before, and I'll say it again. Nothing is written in stone. Your investment structure is not written in stone. You can negotiate. You can be creative with your structure. Please don't come to me with a safe instrument, uh, but you could come in with a hybrid. You can come in with something else. Uh, be creative in how you fund your company right now at the beginning and keep a very open mind to this. Uh, we're, we're not here to pound your company into the ground. We're here to help your company scale up. <laughs> All right. Uh, That's right. Yeah. Believe it or not, we're in the same boat. <laughs> That's right. Uh, so the next question is regarding, you know, other crises that have happened in the world. Because, you know, for many people, it's like, a, wow, we are in a certain, you know, big uh, health and economic crisis. Uh, but certainly, uh, you know, we have gone through different other crises in the world. And you were part of the, uh, uh, you know, you were in the U.S. during the dot-com. Uh, what happened in that crisis that you think that our lessons learn uh, for right. this crisis in regards of First the status of all, thank you so much for aging me, uh, uh, <laughs> <laughs> <Miriam>. <laughs> I'm 43, so I'm not <laughs> <laughs> um, So, uh, I, I mean... You know, you and I, we were just having this discussion. You and I, we come from yeah. emerging markets. Uh, yeah. you, you're, you're, you come from Colombia. I come from Turkey. So we've seen these types of crises before. Uh, you know, when 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 the economy just kind of hits a wall, mm -hmm. uh, and that's something similar. Now that I'll, 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 with regards to what happened, I was in San Francisco actually during the first dot com boom. Um, there is a there is it's the same but different. Now, 
uh, what happened back then, we all knew that there was a bubble going on. We all really knew that there was something not, you know, not a little bit of surreal times mm -hmm. coming around. The valuation was unbelievable. Uh, people just thought that it would just go up forever and ever and ever. Now the economy would go up. Uh, very quickly, the, the, the environment changed within a week to a month. It was a different world. Uh, so it was a very quick train wreck. Uh, and you just kind of had to adjust. The problem here that we're seeing, that I'm seeing at least, not just with the overall economy, but with these companies, is that this is more of a slow motion train wreck because there's so many subsidies coming down uh, that I'm afraid that not all of them are being put to good use on the company level. And, and that could have a longer term effect because these subsidies come with strings attached. So uh, we have to be very, very careful how we tread here. Uh, that, that this isn't, we don't turn this into a train wreck, especially a slow motion one. Uh, and that we, 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 uh, we make sure that our companies are, uh, are, are positioned to move forward uh, on the longer term when this is all said and done, because this is gonna be over. I mean, apparently the vaccines are coming. Let's say, let's uh, see, um, they come in uh, in April, June, towards the end of 2021, we should be all good. Now, that's when we start to think about what's happening here. We could have a roar back in economy, but everything's under debt. So we have the debt problem, right? We, that's the slow motion train wreck that I'm talking about. So we could end up with a much, much bigger recession in our hand. Uh, when, all, when all this is said and done. And as a company, especially as a startup company, startups are never going away. We're going to have startups. We're going to have innovation. We have to innovate. We can't sit still. That's not, there's no, we're going to continue to invest. That's not going to stop. It's just how we maneuver through that process and how we brace ourselves. And uh, 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 we just don't want to panic. If you panic, you're going to make weird decisions. That's, that's what we just do over and over again. Yeah, and that's true. Feel, uh, a downturn. Yeah, that that was one of the things that uh, you know I I've been afraid this year because many people are saying like oh the recession is now I see the recession coming after <laughs> no not necessarily now <laughs> but it, it depends on cycle how, yeah right? cycles happen you can't yeah. you cannot stop that cycle that's true that's true uh, so in in regards of in having this uh, same scenario oh. What type of startups are you looking for right now? Uh, so uh -huh. talking about we are in the middle of pandemic, you know, post pandemic. What type of startups is an angel investor looking at this point? Uh, so that's the other thing that we've noticed is that there's a lot of uh, there's a lot of investment that's uh, that are that that are being made into non traditional type of companies. So company the investors uh, on the angel level uh, who are always tech are starting to invest in life sciences and life sciences are invest. So there's a shift in different uh, sectors, but once again, you know, this is, you know, this, this, it's forcing certain sectors to really kind of evolve uh, as we can see from zoom online education, fraud in online education. We are seeing all sorts of different interesting like companies that are trying to prevent things like that. Uh, those I think, those types of companies, will, they're, they're here to stay. They, they, it's, it's their time. Mm -hmm. um, but really, uh, the whole remote work environment, now I think we've already kind of, we've gone over the hoop. The, 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 everybody's kind of invested in that already. Mm -hmm. uh, so we're going to, once again, when you see this type of mad rush into these types of investments, you see a consolidation play at the end. Uh, and that's what we'll probably see towards, you know, the, um, Q2, Q3 of uh, 2021. Mm -hmm. uh, a consolidation play on all the different video conference platforms and all of that stuff. Honestly, we're, we're looking at everything. We, we want to continue to do about 30, 35% uh, into life sciences. Mm -hmm. um, it's uh, not just always pharma, but, you know, medical device, uh, things like that. And they, they, they we believe will continue to, you know, receive good investment. Um, education, um, digital education is another good one, uh, good sector. 
I mean, it's just, it's really kind of, we just don't know. We play it by the ear. There's a lot of space technologies that were coming by. Now they're kind of idle. Yeah. In, in your case, you have a, a pool of investors. So you, I imagine that you're having different exper experts in different sectors. So you yes. will be evaluating them uh, as per the different experts that you have, right? Right. So one of the advantages that we have is that we have a global perspective mm -hmm. um, and and we see what types of companies float to the top. We see what types of companies are getting more traction. Um, more importantly, because we have a pretty good deep network of investors as well, we see what types of investors are going or leading which types of companies. This allows us to kind of piggyback on some of the existing investors on their expertise. I mean, I say 35% my sciences. I have an economics background mm -hmm. with an MBA in finance. Uh, what do I know about life sciences? But I do know the people that are putting their money in to some of these companies. I could, you know, follow on and say, hey, you know what? Here's here's a little bit of money on uh, uh, from me. Okay. Right? That's, uh, that's how we're doing it. It's important right now, especially right now, to keep a global perspective. Mm -hmm. um, it's it, because your competition is not just North America anymore. And I've said this over and over again as well. You really need to look at, you know, your competitors in Asia. Mm -hmm. uh, in Latin America, in, in Europe, in you know, all across, and it's not just Silicon Valley and Chicago, New York anymore, it's or, or Toronto, nonetheless. We have become a bit of a tech, tech hub here as well. Um, but it's it's a global play, uh, and you really need to look at that, and that's exactly what we're seeing. Some of the companies that are coming in for uh, to, to present, and they have investors from Vietnam, Hong Kong. Uh, you know, uh, UK, etc. So this is something that we really need to to wake up to. Yeah, I think it's extremely important, especially in an ecosystem like the Canadian ecosystem that is uh, conservative in regards of uh, you know the type of investors or mm -hmm. staff they they can have. Uh, but I think it's uh, learning in the process. Uh, I I've seen more uh, diversified portfolios at least in, in the last few years. Right, right. Um, so your organization uh, helps international startups, same as our organization. Uh, both are a part of the startup visa program. Uh, you and the angel investment uh, part, we are in more incubation acceleration process. Um, so how do you see the perspective of international startups coming to Canada? Uh, in the next year or so, is this a good time for them to come here? Uh, how are you guys planning to help to uh, establish companies here in, in Canada to become right. global? Uh, so we're very active in the startup visa program, um, just because it's, it fits our mandate. We have a very global perspective, and startup visa is a very global uh, initiative. So uh, it. We haven't really changed how we do things to, mm -hmm. to engage with the startups from around the world. So it, it, we like it. We enjoy it. I think there's a lot of opportunity. Um, Canada's always been, I mean, first of all, let me take one step back. Startup Visa Program is, uh, is a program by the Canadian government. So it is, mm -hmm. I mean, we all know that Canada has and hopefully can, will continue to be a safe haven. Uh, safe haven for not only just businesses but also with families. We all know it's for families. We just need to communicate to the world that it is for businesses because you know uh, mm -hmm. that you know when businesses don't wake up in the morning and figure out what's happening, just ask themselves, "I wonder how Canada is." So this is a smaller market, and you're right; it is a stereotypical, I guess, if you want to, uh, a conservative market. Uh, so when you come into Canada. Um, you have to have that mind frame, a global mindset. You're not accessing the Canadian market. You're accessing a North American market, one, and then afterwards you're accessing a global market in a safe haven where you can actually, your 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 your, your family, your kids, et cetera, can go to good schools, et cetera, et cetera, all that stuff that comes with the startup visa program. Um, but you still need to keep a global perspective. Um and, you know, investors in Canada are not, you know, throwing money around, right? Uh, we're not, uh, <laughs> uh, we're not, you know, freewheeling money or anything like that. It's a tough place to do business, Canada. Uh, but if you have a global perspective, uh, it can be a very good launching pad uh, because we do have the resources and those resources are, believe it or not, are not as expensive 
as, uh, as, as you would see in the Valley or New York or wherever else. Uh, so it really, and, and there's a connection, you know, there's a, there's a very multi a multicultural connection here. Uh, so it really kind of, you just need to leverage that. Uh, and, and before you come into Canada, you really need to leverage the network. I mean, it's, it's the same thing with anywhere around the world. If you, if I want, if I wanted to move to, uh, uh, you know, relocate to Hong Kong, I really need to have a good network in Hong Kong, right? Uh, awesome. Or to Paris or whatever. If you're going to relocate to Toronto, make sure that you have the right network. Uh, and that's something that, you, you know, your organization, that and us with that um, you know, we, we help with that. And that's yeah. key to building that business. Yeah, and you have seen a lot of businesses. Uh, when when somebody comes here uh, with a business from outside and they have like a um, good business to establish here in Canada, why do you think some startups really fail into make the move in Canada? What they need to know to don't go into that path? Because I've seen some in, in our community, we have seen some businesses that, you know, it, it struggle to actually get into the right path. Mm -hmm. Well, the, the other thing is that not every market is made the same, uh, mm -hmm. you know. Uh, an example they used to teach us way back in school uh, is just, you know, McDonald's. It has McDonald's has different burgers in different countries, but mm -hmm. it's still a burger, uh, right? <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, uh, and that's what it is. You need to make sure that your business model fits, first of all, the Canadian marketplace. Because if you're a B2B, for example, the banks in Canada, the MasterCards of Canada, Uh, payment systems of Canada, although they are payment systems, they have their own nuances because they have their own regulatory, uh, you know, uh, bodies that they have to adjust to. So you have to know and get to know that. And it, it's through our network, your network, my network, and that's how we kind of hold them by the hand and show them, you know what, your product, although it can be brilliant in Colombia, you need to do a little bit of tweaks here and there. And this is how we do it over here. And boom. The MasterCard client that you have in Colombia now is the client over here, mm -hmm. uh, right? It's there are nuances. This isn't a copy paste of your business model, and it 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 takes a little time to get to know that. It, you know, you speak to your investors, you speak to the local investors, you just get to know them, um, and keep an open mind with remember your deal structure, your your offering, um, and and. and You, you can make it. First, you make it over here, then you, you know, jump into the U.S., etc., etc. Thank you for saying that, because we repeat that every single day, I think, <laughs> for startups. Because sometimes they feel like, oh, there are other people that are advancing faster, you know, especially the locals, but of course, the locals know the local market, you know. Yeah. Um, yeah, and, you know, Canada is not an easy place to do business. Mm -hmm. it really, it, people think that it's really easy to do business, but it's very, very difficult to break that network Uh, to break into those circles, it's not an easy place. Uh, to to uh, the, the Canadian dream is tough. <laughs> it's not easy, and, and a lot of people can attest to that. That's true, and more than that, you know, is that uh, I don't believe any startup are coming here just because of the Canadian market size. You know, <laughs> they they come here for what you said before. Is that is a good place to grow your business in global markets? It's like, you know, and exactly. It's just general. What we're seeing is it's driven by uh, by uh, you know family first, and then let's see how our business does. And these people are really brilliant, really smart, really intelligent, really successful. Uh, so it's a program if applied uh, in the right fashion can really benefit Canada. Um, it, it really can. Um, and it, and it's, it's in our interest to uh, uh, create depth in our economy in terms of creating net new verticals diversifying from the natural resources and the traditional thing. You really need, and this is an opportunity for us to bring in really interesting companies that can actually expand our ecosystem. And I don't like that, use the word, use that word, but it's really, you know, that's what we really need to do here. Really diversify, 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 and get that depth so that it's where we, we can, you know, we can, we can have a say in the world. That's true. And now the last question, because, uh, you know, this is a short interview as, uh, is for uh, this um, last event of the year, is what is your biggest takeaways from this year? 
And what will be the main recommendation for uh, startups and investors that are facing right now the crisis for 2021? What, yeah, yeah. what will be that recommendation for them? Yeah. I mean, okay. So uh, I guess the learning curve over here for a lot of people were, you know, just these, uh, and, and for us, we've been through this before, uh, you know, um, crisis, they come and go. Uh, and they will come again uh, in a different form. This form happened to be a virus. Uh, next form will probably be debt, uh, right? Uh, so we, we, these things come, but the effects are relatively, you know, the same uh, economic effects. Of course, this particular one actually has uh, health effects, but uh, uh, it will have, uh, you know, we, we just need to learn from them. We just need to kind of brace ourselves, make sure that we're positioned well. Uh, we're positioned for the future. Um, you, one thing you don't want to do is freeze up and panic. Uh, you really need to go back to your existing investors or you know talk to your existing network and say, you know what? Okay, here we are. Uh, you know, we, we we tried to plan, but here we are. How, what's our next step? They really methodically move up, but quickly, methodically. Uh, and that's something that we should brace ourselves for the next year as well, and just really figure out how we can grow, figure, be innovative. Uh, you know, if you could, if you can't sell the way you can sell right now, how do you sell a different way? Uh, you know, how do you create a different, how do you test your products in a different fashion? Um, look at us, instead of doing this live, we're doing this on Zoom, different, right? It's uh, these little things that actually do work out. So keep an open mind and just, you know, the world keeps on turning. That's right. And uh, keep a positive attitude because, I mean, if we all have to pass through this, <laughs> sometimes I have to uh, remind myself I, I'm not the only one in this crisis, right? <laughs> Everybody it is. Yeah. Absolutely. So, we're, we're in this together. Yeah, we are all in this together. So thank you so much, Osan, for this lovely interview, uh, for your words and, and experience in the investment sector here in Canada. And hopefully we'll see more international startups coming next year to Canada okay. and, of course, uh, trying the market and trying to reach global markets. Absolutely. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, Maria. And that was Osan Isinak. Uh, so Osan is joining us today here for a Q&A. And I see a lot of questions. Hopefully, you know, um, uh, he can hear us because I hey, think he, um, hey. he has some problems in the back end. <laughs> but hey, Osan, do you, do you hear <laughs> me like now? <laughs> hey. <laughs> so, welcome to the I'll, event. I'll I, I event. missed half of my uh, bubble, oh, so you no. kind of <laughs> saved me. And also, I completely well, what I was talking about. No, <laughs> but I got a lot of questions for okay. you. Uh, I don't. I don't. Got, we we are not gonna, going to have too many questions, but uh, you know, just three of them because the other uh, startups have to pitch. Uh, so have you seen the pitches? By I way? did. Yeah. That's a, so far, so good. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> We're missing three yeah. more. <laughs> okay, Osan. Uh, we have a uh, first question is, uh, what is the earliest stage and what are the typical metrics of the earliest company Kerexu will invest in? Oh, um, so we do not invest in ideas. Uh, so we're, we're, uh, we, we have a very global international perspective. Uh, and in order to be able to uh, take companies in through a syndication, it requires... Uh, it requires money, it requires some capital, it requires a lot of resources, so it requires some sort of, you can't just syndicate ideas globally, you can only syndicate good companies that have at least some sort of a prototype, at least preferably something in the market. So the way we've positioned ourselves is really kind of, you know, you get your family and friends and then afterwards maybe some of the local groups and then you come to us if you want to really kind of scale that up. Our investment sizes are anywhere from, um, round sizes, are anywhere from, I've seen two hundred fifty thousand dollars, but generally companies are looking for five hundred thousand to anywhere from six million dollars. And you know, it's very hard to invest sometimes in ideas because everybody has ideas. Yeah, you know what? Happen. 
This is difficult. <laughs> I tell this to everybody. The people who are afraid, you know, oh, yeah, you can take my ideas. You know what? Your idea is worth $1. I'll give you $1 <laughs> for your idea. But you bring it back, I'll give you a million. <laughs> oh man, that's a tough investor. <laughs> no, okay. So uh, the other question is, how did you see COVID affecting the VC markets in 2021? And I see many companies pivoting the approach and being cautious as revenue uh, shrunk in 2020. I think we talk a little bit about that in the interview, but uh, if you can extend a little. You mentioned VC. VCs, uh, there we are seeing a little bit of a pressure, downward pressure. Uh, I mean, one of the things is that you know, VC. You have to realize VCs have a mandate. They have a uh, an eight year, eight plus one plus one, at least about an eight to ten year time horizon where they have to get into a company, and then eventually at year six or so they need to start getting out. This whole COVID thing, one year gone. So all of a sudden, these VCs are looking like oh, they have their portfolio companies. Like, wait a second, uh, I just lost a year. Uh, what happened to my valuations? I got to report back to my limited partners, L LPs. So we've seen this type of pressure uh, on on VC uh, VCs in the past in 2008, 2000, when all the, the major crisis. This happens. It's a cycle. Uh, we're we're seeing that again right now. So we need to be very careful on uh, on on how VCs react and also how how companies and portfolio companies uh, engage with the uh, the vcs as well uh, early stage early stage investors as well i mean you know what uh, every single year the trend is that you know when uh, when you get in as an angel investor uh the 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 time it takes to exit is no longer three to five years it's more like six to eight to ten twelve years now that's a long time to be in a thing so we have to really be a little bit more creative and a lot more aggressive and a lot more open-minded in how we approach our investments and how we think an exit would look like that's true uh and there's you know many i think many people actually think about that but it is um of course, many people struggle, you know, during the pandemic, trying to think, you know, more clear about all this. But that, that's exactly true. This is a well, perfect answer. It's easier said than done. Uh, but yeah, no, that's true. Not, no, no, that everybody's <laughs> under pressure. It's not just you. Uh, it's the investor side as well. And this, you know, if you're really under pressure, it's just you know, pick up the phone and start talking solutions. What do we do now? What do we do next? Uh, nobody, no investor wants a, a surprise email in the morning and say, hey, we're shutting the doors uh, without giving it a one last kind of effort, right? Uh, so, and I'm pretty sure no an entrepreneur and CEO wants to do that as well. So try your options. Everybody's under pressure. That's true. That's true. And I mean, this is a still a business, right? When you are investing in a company, you are still expecting a return. Uh, many, uh, many times they have to say the service, you know, um, this is no charity. <laughs> Anyways, <laughs> they are respectful of um, I, I just have one more question. <laughs> one day. Uh, I just have one more question. Uh, and um, this one is very interesting. And I, I will put this one because it's related with our community. And kind of have like a three questions here, Mario, por favor. Um, so <laughs> he said, hello, Hussan, uh, what's the process uh, So, uh, for investing in companies are planning to start a visa? And uh, what are the advantages and disadvantages you see in companies from Latin America? Uh, so I will I will leave it there because he has more questions there, but I think it, these right. two are, you know. <laughs> right. Well, the startup visa is an interesting program. I mean, Yuri really, uh, you know, um, dug into it quite a bit. Uh, you know, it's, uh, it's, it's a combination of expanding your company in a new market and an immigration policy. Uh, so, I mean, I don't think any of the politicians would want me to uh, uh, use the word immigration when we talk about startup visa, but let's say the way it is. That's kind of, that's kind of what it is. One of the drivers of this is that, uh, and that's why it was built. Um so it's it's a different notion. And if you think that you'll be able to expand, Canada has a lot to offer. So first of all, if, if you're a company in anywhere, it doesn't matter if you're in Latin America, if you're in Asia, if you're in Europe, the MENA regions, Africa, whatever, uh, look at the country for what it can offer. There are certain countries that offer different competitive advantages to companies. Um, I, I had a, uh, I was on a panel for, uh, for, for um, Hong Kong 
uh, yesterday, uh, a message from Hong Kong. And I, and I said the same thing. I said, you know what? Hong Kong has something speci special to offer. New York has something special to offer. Toronto has something special to offer. Do a little bit of homework and say, you know what? Uh, I would actually be able to set up my company in Canada. Do a little homework. Uh, without that network, you can't do anything. And that's the whole point of the startup visa. That's the whole point of the incubation and the uh, the angel stream so that you can come into a network as opposed to you know, walking off the plane, thinking, you know, what do I do next? Uh, so, you know, Canada has some competitive advantages. We have some good tech talent, et cetera. We're right next to the U.S. We're, you know, this is our, it's our, you know, U.S. is kind of our go-to place, go-to market. Uh, so we may be able to help many of the companies. The other thing is that, you know, we, we especially here in Toronto, uh, we have access to uh, most of the U.S., uh, conglomerates headquarters, uh, you know, Canadian headquarters are here in Toronto. So we get you into the door here in Toronto, then you can get into the U.S. market easier because you have a reference. And it's extremely strong uh, outside. <laughs> yeah, it's a good brand. Uh, Osana, good brand. are you going to stay in the event? Because I see many other people actually <laughs> asking questions. I don't know okay. if you have more time. I understand. <laughs> okay. So, Osana, we'll be chatting with you uh, during this uh, you know, time. Uh, we also have networking later. Uh, so, you guys can enter to net networking and do uh, you know, live networking that we are doing right now. Mm -hmm. with yeah, you, you have to experience that part. But, um, Ozan, thank you so much. I'm going to continue with the other three companies, and I'll see you in networking later, okay? Thank Take you. <laughs> Uh, so, guys, I know that we are a little bit late. Uh, people maybe go to networking now, uh, but we are another three companies presenting. This is the last batch, and really, really want to, uh, you know, finish uh, with the three companies so you can actually vote vote for the the best company uh that that you can see um in here for the best pitch sales pitch of the night our judges are actually here uh, uh, uh alan osiel uh blaine kumar mark uh from tech place and as well um andrew uh from kingston uh from city of kingston so i'm going to add uh yes and now uh, so she is uh, representing the standard surveyors uh from hong kong uh, actually, we were talking with, with Osan about Hong Kong now. Um, Jess is going to join us to, to present her pitch. Hi, thanks, Maria. Okay, let me share my screen. Uh, you see my screen now? Perfect. Hello, everyone. I'm Jess from Standard Surveyors, your fast and reliable cargo surveyor. We have been in this business for over 20 years and is the leading market player in Hong Kong, taking care of over $140 million worth of cargo every year. I believe everyone here have done online shopping before. Have you ever worried about getting the wrong item or damaged good? How would you feel? Do you want to get your money back as soon as possible? Imagine you run a global shipping company transporting million dollars worth of cargo daily. Now things happen. You find cargo surveyor to prepare a survey report for your insurance claim. After inspection, he told you to wait for two weeks as he needs to go back to office to write it, tidy up data and images. Two weeks. How do you feel? Introducing Insure, our innovative cargo surveying program. It reduces the time to get a survey report from two weeks to one hour. A reduction in 90%, or in terms of money, save $2,400 for every report. Insure synchronizes site inspection with report writing. Its implemented data uh, guides how to collect and organize data on the spot. Uh, the report is ready right after inspection. You can now proceed insurance claim like a breeze. We're going digital, and we're going after the North American market. Standard Surveyor is a market leader in Hong Kong with presence in China and formed alliances in South Korea, Vietnam, Kenya, and Belgium, covering four continents in the world. Our expansion was start in Vancouver in 2021, then expand to Toronto, Los Angeles, and New York. We're confident, thanks to our lovely clients, among over 200 loyal customers, we have including government organizations, 
Our lovely clients are happy to extend our, our relationships to their Canadian trading branch, including UBS and Dorch. Well, and uh, Canadian Cargo Inspection is a also ensure is the only cargo surfing program in the market. It is the crystallization of our 150 years of industry know-how. We offer the highest quality of cargo surfing services in the market, not to mention our leading position in Hong Kong, our trusted relationships with clients. Canadian Cargo Inspection is a $140 million market. Our target clients in Canada include over 30 global marine insurers, over 20,000 transportation and shipping companies, freight forwarders, and warehousing companies. We'll enter the Canadian markets by utilizing social media like LinkedIn, joining professional associations, employing Google Ads, attending international conferences and networking events. We have the best team to capture the markets. John and Chris have in total 50 years of industry experience and have last standard surveys to dominate the Hong Kong market. Contact us for a free trial, vote for us as the best pitch. Thanks. so much, Jess, for uh, this uh, presentation. Uh, we are going to continue with the next one. Uh, and this time is going to be Praveen Kumar uh, from uh, Malaysia. He is representing, um, uh, Praveen, I forgot your uh, your company, Belfrix. <laughs> Hi, Miriam, how are you? All good, Praveen, you can start your presentation, okay? Okay, you are able to see my screen, I suppose. That's right. Okay, just hold on. I'm having some difficulty. Um, just a minute. Do you want to come back after Enrique, maybe? Yes, please. Okay, no problem. Um, so I'm going to add Enrique Suarez. Enrique is representing Mount X. Enrique, welcome uh, to the event. And after Enrique, we are going to have Praveen. <laughs> hey, Enrique. Hey, how are you? Can you hear me? Yeah, really good to yes. be here. And uh, let me share my screen. Okay. Perfect. So hello, everyone. I am Enrique Suarez. I am co-founder and CEO of Mountex Real Estate Capital. We are opening real estate for everyone. As billionaire Andrew Carnegie famously said, 90% of millionaires got their wealth in, by investing in real estate. The problem is that not everyone has access to investing in real estate until now. Mountex is the first real estate crowdfunding platform who made history by successfully tokenizing the first ever two real estate properties in Mexico, raising $250,000 from private investors. To explain what we do, let's start with Liam's story. Liam is 30 years old. He is a successful entrepreneur, and last year he received an extra money and he was looking into diversify in real estate but he didn't have all the down payment to do it alone. He knew that real estate is a complex market and he didn't know where to start. So there has to be a better way. This is why we created Mountex. Mountex is an international real estate community that allows investors to start with a small initial investment and grow exponentially through our crowdfunding system. Mountex is a digital platform that manages the entire life cycle of the investment. 
We give access to our international community of investors through crowdfunding that allows a smaller initial investment. Our in-house team carefully analyze market opportunities to make smarter decisions with data-driven investment analysis. Then we transform the property into digital, digital tokens using blockchain technology. Finally, we manage and give liquidity by connecting to a second market. With Mountex, everyone can invest anytime from anywhere. First, you find the right investment in our platform. With security, you can invest with confidence in our escrow account. And thanks to our technology, you can trade your tokens the way you trade stock or bonds. We take security and compliance very seriously. Our tokenization is regulated by the Security Exchange Commission in the US, complying with the highest levels of security with international Know Your Customer and anti-money laundering for all our investors. We also work with real estate professionals locally to secure compliance for all our investors. Today, we have launched our first product, Xbrox Max. This is pre-construction properties. Our minimum investment starts from 10,000 US dollars and our investment opportunities generates a return from eight to 12% annually. We are a team of entrepreneurs passionate about technology and real estate. We have more than 20 years of experience investing and developing real estate in Mexico, the US and Canada. We also know how important it is to build an excellent team so we have partnered with the top companies in their fields to do it. Be part of the next generation of real estate investing and start your exponential journey with us. Mountex Real Estate Capital, real estate for everyone. Thank you. Thank you so much, Enrique, really good. So we're going to see if we can uh, start with Praveen. Praveen, if you are listening, exactly, then we go. Uh, let's see if this time is working. Yes, hey, Miriam, I hope so. Just one more, one more second. Just hold on. Yeah, I hope you are able to see my screen, Miriam. Yes, I'm able. To okay. Uh, sorry for the delay. Hello, everyone. I'm Praveen Kumar, the CEO and founder for Belfix Group of Companies. We are a blockchain technology firm uh, focused on issuance, storing, and sharing of verifiable data. Now, uh, what are verifiable data? And thousands of in institutions issue millions of documents um, in employment sector, education sector, and health sector, and yet these cannot be verified in a real-time basis. Uh, this leaves millions of documents unverified. This is basically due to the fact that these institutions, they issue the documents in silos, and these documents are issued to the um, users in the form of either physical document or a PDF document, which cannot be authenticated on a real-time basis. Either you require third-party services or a background verification agency to do the verification. So this increases the cost and the time needed for authentication. Let's uh, see some uh, scenarios where in which uh, an immigration officer verifying your COVID data or vaccination data for, an, uh, for, for the point of entry or uh, uh, an employer who is verifying your educational data or a bank who is verifying your pay slips. All these institutions require your documents to be authenticated and yet there does not exist a single platform to authenticate on a real-time basis. What we have done is we have developed a blockchain-based verification platform uh, over our patented blockchain, which is Bellrium, uh, wherein which these organizations are able to issue GDPR compliant document directly to the user's wallet. So since it is issued to the user's wallet, the user co-owns the document and he is able to authenticate the documents on a real-time basis. So we have developed three different products 
credible for issuance of um, uh, educational certificate, B roll for the issuance of employment certificates, and value is for uh, the health certificates for COVID and vaccine certificates. These three industries put together is a $500 billion market, and we aim to target approximately around 2.3 percentage of the market share. Uh, with a simple pricing of 20 cents per document, we are looking to target $75 million worth of revenue in the next five years, and we are raising a capital of $10 million. Our current customers include national governments and state governments. We have more than 12 different institutions, uh, universities who are currently issuing the certificates on the blockchain. We uh, hold two national level sandbox licenses and uh, multiple hospitals are currently issuing the COVID certificates and vaccine certificates using our technology. Our uh, competitors include the traditional pay players like IBM, AWS, and Microsoft, and also the background verification agency. But um, we expect much more severe competition from uh, the similar players in the market, which is Uport and KYC Chain. We started our business um, in Malaysia in 2015, and uh, since then we have expanded into uh, nine um, additional countries. Uh, without any external investors. And right now with this expertise, we are entering the Canadian market uh, to target the North American region. Uh, last but not the least, um, uh, the founders together have 100 plus years of blockchain specific experience. And with this uh, experience, we are able to take the product and the company to the next level. So with that, I conclude my presentation. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, Praveen. And guys, that was the last presentation of today. Uh, so our judges, uh, Alan Ociel from Ociel Law, Blaine from um, Bright Immigration, Mark from Tech Place, and Andrew from uh, City of Kingston, uh, King Kingston um, Economic uh, Development Corporation, I always get it uh, backwards, <laughs> are going to start deliberating. And while they are doing this, uh, Please go for networking. We are going to be back in about um, uh, five to ten minutes uh, to give the winner to announce the winner of the uh, of the pitch of the uh, of the night. So thank you so much for joining us today. We will be back very soon. In the meantime, go to networking and don't don't leave the event because we are going to announce the winner. Okay, thank you. <laughs>